looking at a brain. So here we've got a brain model seen from a lateral point of view. We're looking from the left-hand side. So this is anterior and then this end posterior. So what we can see here, uh, firstly, one thing that we notice is on the inferior and posterior aspect, there's a structure here that looks like another little brain and that's what it literally translated it means. This is the cerebellum, which means little brain, and that's sitting on the posterior and inferior aspect of the brain. Now just near the cerebellum, in the midline here, we can see the brain stem. Now once this structure here goes through the foramen magnum, that will become the spinal cord. But this inferior part of the brain stem is the medulla oblongata. So that's the medulla oblongata just here. And just superior to it is the pons. So that bit there is the pons, the more superior part of the brain stem. Seen from an anterior point of view, we've got the medulla oblongata here and the pons here. And just superior to the pons is the third part of the midbrain, which is, sorry, third part of the brain stem, which is the midbrain, which is only small. Now let's have a look at them from a mid sagittal point of view. Now we've we're still looking at the left hand side of the brain but this time we're looking at it from a medial point of view. So now this is anterior and posterior here. So this is our cerebellum. Here's the medulla oblongata, the most inferior part. Then there's the pons and then the midbrain which is this small part here. Now in the middle of the midbrain there's a tunnel. That's the cerebral aqueduct right there. That's a little canal that will be full of fluid in life. Now just above that canal, there's a fluid-filled space. Now on this model, you can just see there's a little recess there. Just a tiny little recess here. And there's one on the other side as well. So if you put those two recesses together, when you put the, the right-hand side of the brain on here, it means you have a little vertical space here, which is called the third ventricle. Now the ventricles are fluid filled spaces within the brain and they're full of cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. So this is the third ventricle. Now then the cerebral aqueduct, so fluid from the third ventricle will go down the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle which is here. Now the fourth ventricle is in between the mainly the pons and the cerebellum. So the fourth ventricle in here, the fluid comes down from the third through the aqueduct into the fourth. Now the thing about the third ventricle back up here though is the space is the ventricle but the wall is actually made up of a couple of structures that you need to know the names of. So if we were to draw a line across here we'd separate the two parts. This larger part here is the thalamus. Now the thalamus is where all your sensory neurons synapse when they're coming, they come up the brainstem and they synapse here and then secondary neurons go off to the um, cerebral cortex to send the signal to the brain. So here we've got the thalamus, it's grey matter deep in the middle of the brain. Anterior to this line, this little bit here, is the hypothalamus. So it's only this small little triangular part here, hypothalamus. So it's anterior and inferior to the thalamus. So this is a rare time where if there was a pin here, you could say either thalamus or third ventricle, okay? Because it's hard for me to suspend the pin in midair. So you could say it's the third ventricle or the thalamus, and either way you'd be right. Same here, you could say it's either the third ventricle or the hypothalamus, and either way you'd be right. So that's the thalamus and hypothalamus, and the space there, third ventricle. Now then, just sitting above the thalamus, here we've got some white matter. Now remember, white matter is axons. So here we've got cables that are running from the right side of the brain to the left. So this structure here, the corpus callosum, is the structure that joins the right and the left sides of the brain. Now if someone has a larger corpus callosum, it does actually mean that they have better communication between their left and right brains and so therefore they can probably do more than one thing at a time. 
probably this person can multitask and actually have a coherent conversation while they're doing something else, some other physical task. But not everyone can do that. Some people that have a smaller corpus callosum, nothing wrong with their brain, but they may only be able to do one thing, concentrate on one thing at a time. Okay, so that's the corpus callosum there. And then above that, we have, of course, the cerebral hemisphere there. Okay, so next, uh, let's have a look from a, a lateral point of view now. So we'll turn the, this half of the brain over again and look at the left side of the brain from a lateral point of view. Now, what we've got here, probably the best place to start, notice that there's a, a groove here. Now, each of these grooves is called a sulcus. So there's a groove here that runs all the way from this, the end here, if you like, the, the medial end of the hemisphere, all the way down to this deep groove here. So that one there that you'll see on, on every brain is called the central sulcus. So if you can see a groove that runs all the way from here down to the end here, that's the central sulcus. Now, in front of the central sulcus, there's a gyrus or gyrus. They're the ridges. So this one, it's in front because this is anterior. We can see the cerebellum here, so we know this is posterior. So this one's in front of the central sulcus. That's the pre-central gyrus. So the one behind it, the one posterior to it, is the post-central gyrus. Now, the reason why these are getting a mention the central sulcus is the boundary between the frontal lobe, which is mainly under the frontal bone, and the parietal lobe, which is mainly under the parietal bone. Now, the other things that are really noteworthy here, though, is that the precentral gyrus is actually a little map of your body, and it's a motor map. So if, you, if we were to stimulate a certain part of the precentral gyrus, some part of the body would move. The muscles there would be stimulated and cause a movement, and it's very well mapped out. So we can, we can tell if we stimulated this part, for example, you know, what, which part of the body would move. So that's the pre-central gyrus. It's a motor map of the body. Now, the post-central gyrus is a sensory map of the body. So this time, areas of skin uh, are, are kind of mapped out here, which means that your back, for example, is a tiny little part of this gyrus, but your lips and your fingertips are a huge part of the gyrus. Really sensitive parts of the body take up a lot of space here, but not so sensitive parts take up a small amount of space. So a sensory map here on the post-central gyrus, motor map here on the pre-central. Remember, the central sulcus is the boundary between frontal lobe and parietal lobe. Now also remember, if there's an exam question, you need to be as specific as you can. So if there was a pin here, you would say pre-central gyrus. If there was a pin here, you'd just say frontal lobe because you don't need to know the names of any of these gyri here, okay? So this would be frontal lobe. This would be pre-central gyrus. Even though it's part of the frontal lobe, you be as specific as you can. So then this would be post-central gyrus. This would be parietal lobe. Now, the boundary, that the, um, the bone that covers this part of the brain is, of course, the occipital bone. So this is the occipital lobe. And the boundary between the parietal and occipital lobes is actually seen on the medial surface, which is a bit of a pain. But it'll be this uh, sulcus here, which means that the, the occipital lobe is basically this kind of little triangular part down the bottom here. So if I wanted to pin it and I wanted you to say occipital lobe, I'd make sure I pinned it right down here, nowhere near the boundary, so that you can be sure that it's occipital lobe. Okay, same with parietal lobe. I pin it way up here somewhere, not not somewhere here where it really could be either. Okay, so occipital lobe, parietal lobe. Then, out here, under the mainly under the temporal bone, we have the temporal lobe. And notice that it's separated from the frontal and parietal by this really deep group here. So this is temporal lobe, and then occipital, parietal, sorry, wrong spot, parietal, and then frontal. Okay, now that's four of the lobes of the brain, but there's a fifth one, and the fifth one is deep, or at least it appears to be deep. Now, if we gently move the temporal lobe away from the frontal and parietal lobes, what we can see is that there's more 
sulky and gyre in there. There's more grooves and ridges. That's called the insula, which is the fifth lobe of the brain. Now, it looks there to be quite deep, but I'll just show you what it actually is because it is cerebral cortex, and the cerebral cortex is the su uh, out outer or superficial surface of the brain. But here we've got a very expensive model where I can show you, just imagine that all of this is the cortex. So this is all cerebral cortex. It's the outer surface of the brain that's made up of grey matter, which is cell bodies. Now, this part down here, where between my thumb and forefinger, is temporal lobe. This part up here between my right uh, thumb and forefinger is the, is the parietal and frontal lobes. And the insula is this part in the middle. And all that happens is that the, the brain, oh, if, it's, if it folds properly, is folded like that. So we've got temporal lobe here, frontal and parietal lobes here, and then insula deep in there. So it really is, the insula really is part of the external or superficial surface of the brain. But because of the way the brain is folded like this to fit into our skull, the insula looks like it's deep, but the insula being this bit over here is actually still on the outer surface of the brain. It's still a superficial structure. If we could fold it out like that and make it flat, we would see it's all part of the external surface of the brain, but we'd have a really different shaped head if that's how we, our brain was set up. So it looks like a really deep structure in here, but it is actually part of the external surface of the brain. So that's the insula. Um, and then, deep inside the insula, we have some structures called collectively referred to as the basal nuclei. Now, in order to see them, we need to get out a different model. So here we've got a 15-part plastic brain model. Now, notice that it's pretty similar, although while we're here, let's just have a quick look at something. Here we've got the, the cerebellum down there, so we know this is um, posterior. So again, we're looking lateral view, left-hand side of the brain, but it's a full brain this time, not just half. So we've got frontal lobe here, and then we've got parietal lobe here and occipital and temporal lobes. We can see the insula in there. We can see it's deep, cerebellum, and then medulla oblongata and pons here. So if we open up... Oh, sorry, I was going to look at something external first. Just note that on this brain model, here's our post-central gyrus, and here's our pre-central gyrus, and here's our central sulcus, but they're nowhere near as clear uh, or neat as they were on that other model. So, and, and that's true in life. Different brains will be slightly different shapes. The central sulcus will be in a slightly different spot in different brains. And sometimes it's really easy to pick the two gyri and the sulcus. Sometimes it's pretty difficult to tell which one it is. Okay, So just bear that in mind. If you're looking at real brains, it can be tricky to tell what's what sometimes. Now, if we open up again uh, this model, and have a look at some of the deeper structures. This one's really cool. You can pull this one apart further than you can the other one we were just looking at. But if we pull all that apart, we're looking here at the insula. Now, on this model, we can take the insula off and see what's underneath it. Now, these red structures here are the basal nuclei. Now, they're nuclei, which means they're collections of cell bodies, so it's grey matter. But on this model, instead of being grey, they've made them all red. Now, there are different parts to the basal nuclei, uh, and you can see, eventually, when I, when I remove it and get my hand out of the way, you can see there are different parts. So there's one part here, another C-shaped part here, there's a slightly different coloured part there. So there are different structures to the basal nuclei, but you just need to know them as basal nuclei. Now, they used to be called basal ganglia, so if you hear someone referring, and they were called that for many years, so if you hear someone referring to them, or it's written in a textbook as basal ganglia, that's fine, that's okay, it just, they just mean basal nuclei, okay? They're now called basal nuclei. Now, on this model, they're all red. We can see them on the other side. Slightly different arrangement on the other side. You can see through this clear bit here, you can see there's a red bit down in there. They're all still red. So if there's something red pinned on one of these models, basal nuclei. So they're deep, they're collections of cell bodies. Now deep to the basal nuclei, actually it's better on this side, deep to the basal nuclei, if we pull off the white matter that surrounds them, so this is axons running up in between the basal nuclei, if we pull all that off, what we can see here is grey matter again, deep within the brain, this is the thalamus. 
but this time we're seeing it from a lateral point of view. Now often in, in textbooks um, and pictures that you'll see, the view you get of the thalamus is just this, where you're looking at the third ventricle, where there's a recess there, and you're looking at the medial wall of the thalamus here, and this is where I said, if it was pinned here, you could either say third ventricle or thalamus. If it was pinned here, you could either say third ventricle or hypothalamus. And on this model, there's even a little green line there, which is not meant to be the border, but it does go pretty much where the border between the hypothalamus and the thalamus is, so it's really handy for that. Um, but that's normally the view you get. But on this model, we can get a lateral view. So this is all thalamus here. So you can see that it is actually a three-dimensional structure. And then this bit here is the hypothalamus. And again, you can see it's a three-dimensional structure instead of just seeing the medial wall, which is what you normally get. Now on this one too, um, the third ventricle is a little deeper than it was on the other one, so you can see the space there. The cerebral aqueduct is huge, it's a bigger tunnel than it was on the other one. And here's the fourth ventricle here, it's a bit easier to spot as well. So we've got medulla, pons and midbrain here, cerebral aqueduct going through the midbrain there. So that's thalamus there and there, and then hypothalamus there and there. So it's really cool to be able to pull this apart so so uh, deeply, so much, and see all those structures. Now, only a couple of structures to go. I'll just quickly come back to this model. Two things you need to see on here. One, longitudinal fissure. Now that's this division here between the left and right halves of the brain. So if we put that back together, here's our longitudinal fissure running right between the left and right cerebral hemispheres. Then out here between the temporal and frontal and parietal lobes, this is the lateral sulcus. So that's the one that you open up to find the insula deep inside there. That's the lateral sulcus. Now, there's only, I think, one structure to go. Let's have a look then at this. Now this, if you were looking carefully or closely, you would have noticed that this part of the model here was actually right in the middle. And it's the one that's so much fun when you find it still on the table after you've put this 15-part model back together because it's right in the middle here. So it's actually the fluid-filled spaces of the brain. It's the ventricles. And it's as if, we, as if the fluid were plaster or something like that that's then become solid so that you can see the shape of the fluid-filled spaces that are inside the brain. Notice that this part here is in between the halves of the thalamus and hypothalamus. So this part here in the midline is the third ventricle. Then there's a little tubular part here, a little tunnel, that's running down to another space. So this is the cerebral aqueduct, and then this is the fourth ventricle here. So this time the ventricles are solid. Rather than being a space, you can actually touch them and see the shape. So third ventricle here in the midline, cerebral aqueduct, and then fourth ventricle, which means that these two, these really weird, look like a ram's horn shaped part here, are the lateral ventricles. Now they don't get called first and second, they're just right and left lateral ventricles. Okay, so I, if either one of those is pinned anywhere, you just say lateral ventricle. Now this part would be in the frontal lobe, this part would be in the parietal, this part would be inside the occipital lobe, this part would be inside the temporal lobe. So they're fluid-filled spaces inside the brain. That's lateral ventricle, third, cerebral aqueduct, fourth. Now we do have another model showing those structures. It's just a different colour, that's all. So that's the same thing there, showing the ventricles quite nicely.